Welcome to this week's presentation. Uh, the world is heating up and uh, God, the drama, the points of conflict, the points of tension um, that could easily, I mean, boil, pots are boiling over left and right. But I mean, the pressure cooker is, is built up to probably the highest point of tension I in my living memory have ever experienced it. And I think even people in their 70s can say the same thing. Um, so I figured what what better way to address today's or this week's meeting than by bringing in our good friend Joaquin Flores, who's already done many presentations for our for, for the Rising Tide Foundation, for the Canadian Patriot at different times. We'll decide which platform is going to host it today once this presentation is over. Um, Joaquin is somebody who has managed one of the best cutting edge telegram channels that I subscribe to. Highly advise that people get on board with new resistance, t.me backslash new resistance in the the description box of this video as well for those who don't know also he's a writer geopolitical analyst with a good sense of history a good sense of philosophy and a good sense of morality which is the most important thing which is why i always really appreciate having uh joaquin on also carlos cj just arrived who is hosting today's broadcast on rogue news so we have a simultaneous live broadcast uh streaming as well so we're going to get questions in from a variety of people after the main presentation is over again this is like usual a pretty open flowing uh, dialogue process. Joaquin will share some insights regarding the current strategic situation. And um, for those listening on Rogue News, write your, your question into CJ and CJ will transmit it to me to, to then transmit it to Joaquin. And for those here living, uh, listening in act, uh, live, do like usual, pop your name in the, in the chat box. I'll call upon you accordingly. And that's it, Joaquin. Thank you. It's all yours. Well, like you were saying, um, things are heating up, things are bubbling over. And um, I think there are so many eyes, of course, like on two locations, one Israel, uh, two Ukraine, maybe not in that order. Um, in terms of something catastrophic popping off, um, either either country, either location is a place where something could, could really catastrophically happen. Uh, but I would also include Russia, uh, I would include Palestine, it's just those conflicts, but it could happen on either territory of either of either country in either case. So but those are things to be looking out for, because um, very clearly you can understand from analyzing um, the foreign policy position of the Russian Federation uh, with regard to um, the conflict that it's directly involved in, in one which it is observing and uh, managing along with other countries at, at some distance and not able to really manage it in terms of determine the outcome, but really manage the potential for instability that could arise should it escalate. So I think in both cases, there's a general desire um, on the part of, uh, I would say, not only the Russian Federation, but a lot of other countries. Um, I, I wouldn't even polarize it in terms of BRICS versus non-BRICS or something or anti-BRICS or whatever. You know, it's just, there's a general, uh, it would help everyone, even the Germans are writing about it, the French are writing about it, if the war ended and there was some normalization of relations with Russia. But um, so towards that end, um, there seems to be that the there's a crew or committee or whatever you want to call them, be that as it may, um, their foreign policy push at this moment has been to create escalation and crisis. So um, whatever their strategic uh, long game is in that is, of course, like a highly contentious. It's a matter of heated debate. I think there's a lot of great people that are talking about this and writing about it out there. Um, but there's no doubt that the realignment of Turkey um, along other lines, um, the realignment of um, the realignment of Turkey um, in a in a in a way that uh, more, uh, I would say, articulates a a a um, multilateral approach, which um, is, uh, you know, one could compare to a multipolar approach, but at the very least, um, they're engaged in multilateral um, machinations geopolitically, and not just machinations, but implementation of stratagems and long-term policies, um, where they're not going to be they're clearly not going to be pulled into being a, a foil or a fall guy or a part of some uh, NATO uh, frontal assault at this time. So they just they don't have that relationship with NATO where they're going to be all in with any military adventure. And they've articulated that. Then, of course, you have the um, their 
desire to uh, negotiate some type of terms uh, with the Syrian government and with the with those things. Again, you have a group of people that are trying to make compromise. They're trying to get past the past. They're trying to say, okay, let's let's get things in a more rational direction. Um, before the, you know, if we could reset like to before 2010 on a lot of these things with the relations between some of these states. Um, so you saw uh, we had subsequent to Syria being readmitted to the Arab League, you had the Saudis make overtures, you have the Turks making overtures with the Syrians about their relationship to um, a tiny part of uh, occupied Syria, which Tur Turkey still holds, and uh, as a remnant of the Syrian war, which really isn't over, but it's like a frozen conflict, and there's there's still things to iron out big time. But um, but when you look at the the way that um, the IDF has been involved in their adventure and the way that they've been using uh, linguistics to primarily target um, their maneuvers and their ideas at the um, American audiences, like they've introduced into the lexicon that they have to hold the Philadelphia corridor. And it's like, oh, it's like Philadelphia. What? We got to protect Philadelphia. You know, like, yeah, you got to protect Philadelphia, man. That's what that, that's what that is. So they've got this um, Philadelphia corridor that's kind of near linguistically going to program people to like identify it's easy to say it's not like some foreign word and it kind of feels like home so um but in in their their policy or articulated um uh, commitment and i say that like at least articulated in the policy officially um to, to to not pull out of gaza and to hold the philadelphia line whatever um, they're going to be dealing with increased uh, problems from the north. So they they are going to be trying to, uh, how should we say, um, speak in the direction as if they want people to return back to the northern areas, but yet not actually being able to return them. So they're trying to now, they're changing their their language from, okay, like people need to be pulled out of here so we can get the job done, to um, we need to change the policy. We're, we've, we're, you know, we've now activated the army, um, the Israelis just said, in order to implement the, our policy change, which is to return the people to the area, right? So that's, well, that's what was the problem. They had to implement the policy change to they're going to return the people to the area. So meanwhile, um, we're seeing from Hezbollah more and more sophisticated usage of drones and drone attacks and things like this um, on IDF. Uh, observer areas and things like this. So you have um, an open call, an open need it was announced previously. Not you know, this, this is not new information, but that the IDF wanted to pull together another fifty thousand soldiers. So um, that raises questions about what force they have, what they what they think they're gonna need. You know, and that, that doesn't mean that that's what they've lost or that's what they think they're gonna lose. Um, it just means that for, they need that much more. And I think that's hard for them to pull off at this time. So anyway, you have all the, you have where it looks like what, what Israel's main gambit is if they can somehow pull in France or pull in Germany or pull in the United States. And it looks like it would probably more likely be like the, um, the U S or France, um, Canada, countries like this into the conflict more directly um, and but what that looks like and, and how and how the American public would think about what that conflict is or what does it mean? And, you know, what who, who are we fighting against? Right. Then it starts to become um, a very problematic uh, subject, given that this is an election year where voters sentiments about war are like, no, this is this is no longer uh, any issue other than a, the, the center, the center of American politics, the broad center reaching deeply into the left, reaching deeply into the right, just broad consensus, and but emanating from the center now, is against war. So we, that I think if you want to talk about in terms of positive developments, um, basically um, anyone who wanted war right now would have to be pretending to, to not want war. Um, so, you know, think when you think about the that situation and in, in, in that light, 
any number of things are possible, Matt. But um, with Russia and Ukraine, um, immediately, I, I think it was just a few days after the curse incursion, I voiced my opinion that this was, uh, you know, that the that the Russians had been aware that this attack was likely to happen, that the that the press, that the Russian media, like on the on the day of of the typical, like if you if you see like an outside looking in of a society, it always appears much more uh, uh, homogen uh, uh, homogenous, and it seems uh, and the the way that things are likely far more likely to be like orchestrated in the society, given like the, the different ways that controls work in a society, it's like you're a little bit easier to see on the outside looking in of a different society, even though the same rules largely apply to our own society, right? So when you looked into like Russian media, when you looked into like Russian telegram, they had a whole like holographic reality of like, how did our generals, how did our commanders not see this coming and all this stuff, right? They had this whole holographic reality of like, oh, here's, Here's, here's civil society having this like conversation about, you know, how can we improve our military? And well, well, you know, we're not always we're not always winning, you know, we, and it would be, I think, difficult to like explain, you know, maybe it was a decision was made that would be much more difficult to explain that uh, that they just needed to um, pull back, like move backwards to bring them in into an area that they could then, you know, uh, encapsulate them. And um, so I said that, I think, August, just whatever, a few days after it happened. And I think people are still so pulled into the into the. Um, the story, you know what I mean, just the narrative, um, the hyper reality that um, but only now, like uh, I think now, if you look at what some different like uh, people who are analyzing the war are talking about, like you can see that they're clearly saying like, yeah, like Russia set this up. You can see they had foreknowledge and they create, they created the conditions and basically like lured them in. Right. So it's, it's good that now people are been more red pilled about that. You know, I, it was a little alienating there for a moment to go out on the limb and say that at the time, but it's, um, but you know, sometimes you're wrong and sometimes it pays off and, you know, but just other people, when you're starting to see things and you're doing your own open source intelligence and you're gathering and you're sharing it with communities, like, you know, use your intuition. Oftentimes intuition is dead on as long as you're, you know, when you're if you're following basic rules of reason and um, making reference to already known ways that things work, then you can, it's very, you know, it's very good to go with intuition. Mm. Yeah, especially when you, you have a sense that this, the actual financier oligarchy which is trying to pull strings are not fundamentally all that creative and just in terms of the Kursk invasion I mean it took a lot of elements from something that was a provable failure 80 years ago when the Germans tried something obviously on a larger scale but in, in principle not that different not different enough and in terms of the blitzkrieg invasion and the failure of the blitzkrieg by not recognizing the, the tried and true Russian approach to absorbing your your enemy in their hubris and then cutting them off um which funk which was really a turning point in world war ii um they just didn't seem to take any of these lessons of history and went full in um so now you got lloyd austin who's going out saying actually nothing seems like it's going to change that won't be a definitive factor in changing anything as far as the outcome of the war whereas just a few weeks ago he was among the the many voices saying this is it this is the the great success story here so what what changed in the last four weeks? Like uh, what resulting in this this uh, absurdity? Right. I mean, you had a, you had this. I, I remember because I was in the United States when the curse concursion began, and um, and you had a media focus on it. And uh, at that area, that was like you know they they were kind of focusing. They were doing the kind of map progress thing for like the first week. After the first week, you didn't really have any of that you know map changing at all. So then it was sort of, uh, all right, well, let's not talk about the progress. Now let's talk about, are they accomplishing the mission, right? So they switched it up to accomplishing the mission uh, and said in terms, they stopped showing, you know, in terms of linear progress on a map or, you know, uh, territorial acquisition, because that wasn't happening at a certain maximal point, just I think in the first few days or week. So then um, that's the way the story went. So mm -hmm. after after a couple of weeks, it just became evident that this was something that um, they 
were no longer interested in uh, in pursuing, um, or they had that already kind of sorted in their way that they wanted to approach this map is always possible. Um, but it seems like there's always this pressure on Zelensky and then, you know, generals or Sierski or whoever has to kind of make a statement. And, um, and one of the things that as a consequence of, of, of this, whatever this was, you want to, you know, in, in Kyrgyz, it's, it's bizarre. Mostly it's information war. Mostly it's used as product. These are things that also parallel to various um, uh, strategic use of uh, proof of concept or, you know, proof is in the, uh, is it, it's like this idea Hitler was doing too with his, with his uh, um, way of doing geopolitics. Whenever they, um, when they were uh, at different points, obviously towards the end, uh, losing support among different uh important people for them and they, they would kind of uh, plan adventures like this. Kursk was one of them. Um, they would kind of do adventures like this to show that they still had um, what it took to do something. And then, you know, that and information war was even a thing back then, right? Because you, it was for them, they were making product for more important decision makers. Uh, it's, it's questionable to what extent, uh, we even, you know, have decision makers uh, in, that are that have to be proved something, you know, in between Western countries, um, as opposed to just the order going through. Right. But um, but I mean, I don't know how much leeway, you know, France or Germany really have um, to back out of this uh, of, of sanctions, for example, mm -hmm. against Russia, let alone, you know, putting all the, the NATO resources into the into the project. So uh, they're nicely demilitarizing as a consequence. And it's not even clear that they're going to be in the position to purchase things that that even it's just inco it's incoherent, incompatible with reality plan that, you know, that the idea that they would be able to rearm after this is just ludicrous because as a rule, they they got rid of things that they were barely able to hold their like baseline, you know, strategic uh, amount of, uh, of, su of such weapons. And they basically had given these to Ukraine. And but the. The thing is that um, uh, those and new ones would be insufficient in and of themselves for accomplishing aggressive actions against Russia. And then they would need to spend with money they're not making because of energy they can't afford because of the sanctions. So it, it, they're just, it's a very, very strange situation that, that Europe would be in, right? What do you think of um, Mikhail Khodorkovsky's... Um messaging that he threw out there I, just a few days ago saying that um this was a test actually the cursed thing to see if russia would attack any nato country with the logic that that was put forward was that well it was so apparent that nato was so active in guiding the process you know various nato legionnaires from from the west were were directly on the ground um being captured by by audio and video footage um that it was like a, a way to provoke russia to see would they actually attack and now that we know that they won't attack he was saying that gives now us an um or we in the west um an, a, an ability to go the extra mile in supporting long-range precision missiles and other things that could develop more of an attack more of an affront onto russian territory do you think that he was bluffing or is that actually a, a consideration behind what was done? No, it's, um, it is a very, it is, it is a consideration. I, I, I don't know that he's bluffing. I think actually what he's saying, what how what he thinks, it makes sense if you break it down. Um, you know, corollary to that point. Sorry, <clears throat> something got in my eye. Corollary to that point. Um, you know, you have the assassination attempt on on Trump, and um, you know. Even though it was more than certain that the, the planning for Kursk happened some time ago, um, you know, if Trump had been assassinated, you can imagine that there, that Europe, uh, that NATO uh, would have been more emboldened to, to have um, more uh, of a push there. And they would have they, if, if Trump had been assassinated, there would have been much more room to maneuver. Now, there's no possibility then. If Trump is assassinated, that anyone but a neocon is going to be the president, regardless of the whoever, whichever party wins. Nikki Haley, OG, thanks, right? So 
you you get um, you know when if Trump is out now now no matter who wins they're like okay we've got the anti-Russia alliance sealed so we're ready to continue to escalate and escalate knowing that we're not going to have a continuity uh, a continuity of strategy problem right um, so what could they do with that well we already saw like how many of the mercenaries are actually from A5 countries. And uh, it's, I mean, it's a ridiculous thing. It's, it's uh, mostly like uh, AUKUS and Canada, like Australia, US. Um, and uh, it's, um, you have a lot of other Polish soldiers and <clears throat> the using obvious NATO assets and going in and um, and attacking the uh, into Russian territory of Russia, undisputed Russian territory. Um, clearly, um, is a uh, helps to is a is the right escalation to probe what Russia's response would be, because much more than that, you there's you take the same risk of probing. But there's but there's a lower level that you could have done, and this was that lower level, um, something chemical, biological, nuclear of a scale, like a weapons of mass destruction usage against a Russian city or Russian something, is the next escalation that you know, and um, and Russia is saying in the case of that that um, the U.S. should not think that Russia would limit its response to. Um, Europe or NATO or other NATO countries besides the U.S. Like Russia very clearly articulated that they would respond um, directly to the U.S. And, and all of that with that elaborate. So I think um, this part of it is critical for people to, to digest that, um, like, as you were saying, never before in your lifetime, and you were saying people of all ages at this point, um, have not had, you know, this is this is more than the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, at, at, just bear in mind that, you know, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, you actually, at least you had Kennedy there. So now we have who? It, it's not even clear. It's it should be it should be Harris based upon the cognitive condition. Right. But it's also obviously not Harris because this is not her area. This is not her arena. So what does that leave us? Now, the Kursk incursion, imagine if that was to be a bridgehead for a much more reinforced grouping. Um, the Poles, uh, Canadians, Americans. I mean, it's, I'm, and what I'm, I keep saying this because this is like based on telegram channels that only focus on showing you the dog tags or whatever off of the bodies and in all of the ones that curse it's like half, more than half or two thirds of these guys are not even Ukrainian mm -hmm. so you know what does that mean and then and then what does that you know where does it you know you, it's just the 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 horrifying idea of what would have happened if Trump was assassinated as it just for all other reasons, it seemed just like a guaranteed shot. I mean, it doesn't even make sense almost that he's not, that he's alive. So, um, that, uh, the alignment of Kursk had changed, you know, changed, you know, after, uh, after it was clear uh, the point of curse and what you know how curse would would go even in the planning stage uh, based upon their various models that they build about contingencies um, the assassination of Trump worked against the very potential usage of curse that they were not able to go with that plan um, so there's of course there's <clears throat> so just to kind of like review the three possibilities or like that, um, well, not there, one is not uh, in contradistinction to the other. The one is just about how Russia planned to fall back and use maneuver warfare. And then the other is that 
um, with NATO, um, the high usage of, of NATO equipment and NATO mercenaries indicates that um, one, this could have been a bridgehead, which the outcome of the assassination attempt could have had some influence on what they would do, what Kursk would actually be, what the point of it would be. And then um, even in the limited scenario that it doesn't serve that, you know, it doesn't serve as a bridgehead for anything wider. Um, it does in the, in to, to paraphrase uh, Kordakovsky, you know, test the histamine response of the Russian Federation and kind of where are the red lines, you know, they made, so the countries make statements about, you know, generally, if you do this, we're going to respond. So then it's like, what does Russia's response look like, right? Well, it looks like they neutralize like 600 uh, more uh, foreign advisors and mercenaries um, in, a, in a separate strike. And uh, this was also last week. So people are probably all over that news. And um, I mean, this was one that the, that the Zelensky government tried to say was 40 were injured, 40 were killed and 60 were injured or something. Um, but it looks like it was like 500 or more. Wow. And reports will still come out like reports will still come out. And um, uh, as of uh, Boris uh, uh, Rosen, uh, Colonel Kassad, the Russian blogger, uh, he says, like, look out for just how this thing works in the news is you just look out for in when the news is reporting on normal, like training deaths and this, like, oh, helicopter went down. Like it, there's different ways that they cover these deaths when especially when um, there's media attention or if the, the person who was killed had any uh, rank of, of note. And they need to say something so that it'll, you know, typically it'll be like a training accident, helicopter crash, something. Um, but they happen, uh, they happen in relative close time, like in the month or so that follows like the actual event that people suspect maybe that that person was actually killed at. Mm -hmm. Um, but the point is that, you know, a lot of war train spotters are pointing out that the number of the, of NATO mercenaries in the Kursk incursion was super high. So that's just the takeaway, yeah. whatever that means. Like we laid out different things that couldn't. Right. Um, we're going to start transitioning a little bit to a broader dialogue with those here in attendance uh, and with Joaquin. I got one other question. I mean, you have really distinguished yourself as a color revolutionary uh, expert um, as far as being able to map out where these things occur, why they occur, how they occur, what to do about it. And, um, there's a there's a variety of of hot spots when the Bangladesh just suffered something pretty bad um, with the ouster of Hasina. Um, we've we got certain things that are blowing up in Honduras right now that I'd like to get your take on at some point. Obviously, Venezuela navigated through this, but it was very dangerous. Still is. There's actually a siege or something on the Argentinian embassy in Venezuela that's underway right now, which is interesting considering what is controlling Argentina. Um, but I guess with that in mind, uh, you've, re you've returned to Serbia. Now, before you left, I know at the beginning of August, the Serbian president gave a warning that he had received intel that some form of foreign directed coup, possibly involving a mixture of military as well as of, uh, weaponized mobs was underway. Um, do you have a take on that? Like, where is that at? Has that been nipped in the bud? Is that still a, a thing? What's going on with that? <clears throat> it's um, so when just when you visualize a government and you visualize uh, a, a country and every time, you know, the, that a country has different generals and those generals in that country's military attend different international forums and meetings that uh, have some purpose, which the two countries agree that they're going to have their guys meet. Um, what goes on behind the scenes is that that's the place that people get contacted. People can develop side relationships. People swap business cards and stuff like that. So um, because of because of the communications that have been available since the telephone um, and since um, encrypted communications um, are more possible than they were 
in the past when it comes because telephones could always be tapped and um you know you get um the you have many more way many more opportunities to organize the the human resources and the human tell necessary for a coup in a country so serbia is up against all of these um a combination it's uh, of, of of attacks that all come from different directions, and the and the government is basically uh, well, constantly being pressed with these like Sophie's Choice type outcomes, um, and that's how they get pressurized. That's how that's how the, the the Serbian state is being pressurized. And I say government and I say state interchangeably, because the crisis that Serbia is in attacks on this government will result in a process of dissolution of the state. And um, generally speaking, in countries that are smaller, when they're going to have a crisis area time, and that happens a lot when you're smaller, because a lot of countries that are picking on you, they, um, um, there's, a, there's, there's a model in which the functions of the government and the functions of the state have to merge. So um, in other words, you need continuity of governance, um, even even though you're going to have uh, you know elections, and even though sometimes you might lose, everyone who's in the game must be you know opposition and all that. They must be committed to the same continuity of policies on a certain array of things. Okay, well, all of those different parties are part of this coalition that makes up the Serbian Parliament today. So now that includes, so they're all, you know, anyone who's, who's not in the actual, uh, you know, party of Vucic, progressive party is some type of opposition. So, but that's systemic opposition. And then you have parliament, then you have other systemic parliamentary opposite opposition that makes census in parliament, but um, they're not systemic opposition. So, um, the system is like a long-term commitment that the society embarks on some kind of civilizational decision. Now, um, they have to get from A to B, like uh, a country, you know, that's developing, that small country, it has to have a, an idea of where it's going. So um, that thing has to be able to weather, uh, you know, changes in government in four, every four or six years or whatever. So anyway, um, how to how to institutionalize those things? And then how do you and then how do you have like the fail safes so that let's say you don't get into a Titanic situation where now you're overcommitted to this one direction, right? You've like shaped the the discourse in society, civil society, the pluralistic institutions. You've all kind of cajoled or shaped them or inspired them to see this one direction. And what happens when you have to turn the the Titanic, right? So. There's trade-offs. So we're not talking about solutions. So we're just talking about the basically you kind of have to make a decision and you have to go full full on into it. So Serbia's done that and they've done that. And so that's why we are facing in uh increased inst instability. And there's like they're they're being told, you know, hey, if you don't um if you don't do this, then we're going to put this pressure on you. Or if if you don't do this, then we're going to do this other thing. And there's only so much that they can take. And then there's different things that are, are that they should not, you know, most of the things they should resist. Some of the things they have to do. Some of the things that they know that they shouldn't do and that are the least optimal things are things that they're forced to do. And then it's like, then what do you do next? Well, now you have to buy some credibility from the public somehow. Well, that's hard to do. So anyway, that's the this this is a backdrop for like these color revolution scenarios, um, because uh, it isn't like the government has to have some concrete uh, or real desire to to uh, be the be the main obstacle in people's political lives. Um, it's that you get real existing grievances. And then you have real existing grievances. And there's there's even a degree to which in, in a pluralist society, people have educations, there's people that have experience in parliamentary politics or par political organizing or media and messaging. 
and lots of there's a lot of organic resistance to unpopular policies that emerges as long as you have uh, an open society, as long as you have a pluralistic society. So the the problem that happens is that if your society is is open to the extent that people can just arrive on travel visas and then you know hang, live in apartments and then just start like meeting with all these different you know, real grievance holders, stakeholders in society that, that have real grievances, right? Well, now keep in mind that your other team still has all those different generals on their, you know, in their their personal phone numbers in their own, in their own, uh, you know, contacts, because all that, all that uh, networking has already happened, Matt. So at that level, you know, we're, we're showing now the two, these two different intersections where you have at the state, state level, of like just a military summit or some type of meeting, even if it's to meet to disagree about things. Like now you've had human contact. So those generals and those people that, you know, anyone who's basically met with a with an American official or has gotten, you know, is someone that you would want to look at, but doesn't mean that you limit to that. It doesn't mean you want to harass those guys. Mm. You know, it's very, very difficult. So, and you have to treat society the same way. You can't like pressurize society you have to allow people to protest against things and you have to use you have to use those protests as evidence to those that are putting the pressure if you ha- if you are trying to say no this is just uh not this is not something that we can do so um there's like a, a lithium crisis in serbia with this company rio tinto that's uh you know basically been in a fight with the serbian government that they're years behind implementation on this Rio Tinto thing. And um, at this point, yeah, they haven't made a single dollar. And um, I, I was meeting with someone that was telling me that actually like the, the scam is something else. Like they all suspect that Serbia has no intention to actually allow Rio Tinto to begin in a meaningful way. And that um, that that they were buying time with, uh, with one group of investors and that what the Rio Tinto group that their real plan was that they didn't actually believe that they could actually get the deal that they were proposing either. So what they wanted to do was um, take the, take the tentative agreement as evidence in a, in an international court, like an international business uh, settlements court to sue Serbia for sitting on, uh, this deal and then suing them like billions and billions and billions of dollars, like $45 billion for the opportunity cost. Um, so uh, that's what a, a person, I, they wouldn't want me to, to give their name, but that's what a person was breaking down for me. Um, that they, that they, what they thought, you know, and there's really something to it. If you look too, because that, that, that amount of money, something like 45 billion is exactly the amount of money that Serbia made in the IT sphere, uh, at, independent from the the um, rest of the European Union, because of, because Serbia is a is a tech leader. So they're like, but they're trying to put it. They're trying to punish Serbia that operates outside of the EU, and uh, like our tech, like our even your basic internet is not regulated the way the EU is. Uh, like people go and get their everything off Pirate Bay and GitHub. And uh, so you have, it brings down cost of living and entertainment costs like significantly. And um, like GitHub has all the different like uh, parts uh, that those are available in a lot of places, but GitHub is being cut off from some people too. But, um, but being able to, to operate also, uh, there's just a, basically it's a, they don't really enforce IP uh, with digital wares. So um, in Serbia, so it's a huge, it's a huge point of contention. And, uh, you know, I, I have no comment on how much of that 45 billion like stems from like pirating or whatever, but in some way or the other, but, um, but it's an innovative place. It's an educated population in this area. So, um, but the, yeah, so the, so it was suggested that the Rio Tinto thing isn't even what it seems at all um that that this is like designed to be 
a lawsuit about how Rio Tinto didn't get to make this amount of money. And that's supposed to be a, like a threat on Serbia uh, to have to pay this money or face sanctions. They're trying to, what they're really trying to do is create a legal pretext to put these kind of Yugoslav war era sanctions on Serbia. Why? Because to this very day, Serbia has not buckled on the anti-Russia sanctions. And it's like, it's very interesting, Matt, because people always look at Hungary and Hungary gets a lot of focus, even though they're in NATO and even though they're in the EU, you know, and it's important that they are in the EU and NATO and see that it's bad for the EU and NATO's mission doesn't match Europe's needs. But it's interesting that just in our discourse that like Vucic gets beat up at like for, and, and you know, for leading Serbia into the EU or leading Serbia into NATO where he hasn't led them since 2013 or 15 or whatever, 12, 13. Anyway, he hasn't led them. Hmm. And then, I mean, if you include prime minister and president of his roles, um, hasn't, you know, you've got last year or last June, they opened up like 15 of 22 or 22 of 30 uh, chapters in, in the EU negotiations, but that's open. Open just means you're starting to talk about them. Now, the schedule of negotiations to reach a tentative agreement on each of those chapters is six months. So if that's if you move without disagreements. But they didn't agree for a decade on even opening negotiations. And um, But all these things are pressure on Serbia. It would be strategically acceptable to the Russian Federation if Serbia joined the European Union. They're totally neutral on that point. It, in fact... There's no real reason that they wouldn't join the European Union from a Russian strategic perspective. So long as it didn't, as long as it wasn't the European Union that of this type that's based upon uh, a unified model of anti-Russia sanctions. But if if more countries, I mean, in the in the sense that if more countries in the EU were in favor of neutral or good relations with Russia, that would be a good thing. And so, to the extent that EU countries have a veto on certain things maybe another veto in the EU would be good. But they certainly wouldn't want Serbia to be in NATO. But Serbia doesn't want to be in NATO either. Anyway, all these things are just these narratives that go on and on and on. But people never look at the proof of the, in the pudding, like where Serbia actually is and who's actually attacking Serbia. Mm -hmm. I mean, just to be clear, no one in Serbia thinks that Russia is putting pressure on Serbia. No one in Serbia thinks that China is putting pressure on Serbia. Everyone knows that it's the Western Bloc countries that are putting pressure on Serbia. And the only debate is like, you know, how much do we capitulate or what do we do about it? Right. So, I mean, that's that's one thing what that makes color revolutions very difficult in Serbia. Now, they've already had one and they saw the consequences. They were like, you know, one of the more iconic and definitive color revolutions from which we can understand color revolutions in many ways because of the technological factors and other things that were used. CNN and the internet was already around in the nineties. And this is part of like hyper reality. Color revolutions kind of depend on communications technologies of, of post mid century modernity. Mm. Like you can have color revolutions. Like you can, you can talk about like proto color revolutions and velvet revolution. Some of the, anti-communist ones as color revolutions they are color revolutions um but when you the the technological dimensions that are like possible in fourth generation warfare really give and and uh, net centric warfare and um you know as if you if you were to think of for example um uh for color revolutions as something uh within um fourth generation warfare, then it you would then it helps to see it in terms of like, of course, there was always warfare, right? There was first generation warfare, second generation, third, right? And of course, there were always like coups and interfering with people's coups and or fomenting unrest in someone else's country, right? But like a color revolution really depends on 
technological, like you can talk about like the roots of color revolutions or the French revolution, or you can talk about like how color revolution technologies were used like in the Russian revolution and things that are like formative to understanding or building upon that technology. But like in the modern or contemporary sense rather, like color revolutions really are like the people in that country like have to be wrapped up in this in a soft power simulate simulacrum right the people in that country have to be like wrapped up in a soft power simulacrum right and that and that had to do with this idea of the international community and all, all these things that are like not really household or household terms until like the 60s or the 70s so let's transition here to the audience i know some people have had uh some thoughts to get out of their noggin and throw mm -hmm. at you um the first one who got in there early was chris chris you're up man uh oh, thanks joaquin thanks for all your work um so I don't, I don't know if you can comment on the uh the tenant fiasco and and just address um so this stuff <clears throat> Like it's hard to believe that the uh, the timing and the way this comes out. Uh, I mean, it's ridiculous. And and I, I have this tendency to believe that you know Trump has the binder, and somehow the Russia or somehow there's this these white hats that are one step ahead of everything that the uh, black hats are doing. And uh, I want to believe that things aren't going to get uh, more hyper real. I want to believe that there's going to be an end to this, but uh, maybe you could disabuse me of this idea that somehow uh, a good faction has gotten hold of the plan and they're working the plan within the plan, like how this plan is working within the plan and if that's even possible, if that makes any sense. Thanks. Yeah, that's a good question. What um, what particular part of the plan are, do you want to inquire about? I mean, I'm thinking about people who are saying there's a continuity of government. That Trump has this binder uh, that he's somehow staying one step ahead of them. Like maybe he has access to their communications, that kind of thing. Is that even possible? I mean, yeah, you know, the way the things are playing out, you know? right. You think about the assassination attempt, right? He had a very Trump had a very strange phone call with with uh, with Kennedy uh, right after the assassination attempt, like the day after, and. Trump tells Kennedy, so what happens, it's very strange, is that we're seeing the phone call from Kennedy's perspective because supposedly they were doing some campaign shoot and Kennedy said, just keep the camera rolling. He takes the phone call from Trump and Trump says, hey, Biden just called me. Yeah, he was real nice. He said, how, how am I doing? But he also had a question. He said it was real interesting. How did you know to turn your head at just the right time? So, right. I mean, it's to me just inconceivable, but, um, you know, the, the chances of turning your head at just the right time, um, who knows? But I mean, if, 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 if you had information to tell you that, that how that shot was going to be taken, I don't even know how that would work, but yeah, it's, um, but Certainly, certainly there's two there's two models that could describe, um, you know, Trump um, and any successes that he may continue to have, you know, um, and they don't necessarily they're not necessarily totally counterposed to each other because they can kind of meld or blend into each other. But, you know, one is that um, is that he is really a systemic opposition figure. But he had, but there are enough people that predate him in the in the military, in intelligence, that see from a from a systems analysis perspective, like which direction this American policy is taking us over some cliff, right? That is then, and so then they're they're just certain that that can't that can't be the policy that we have. Let's say a preemptive nuclear strike on Russia or something like that. Who knows what, right? So who knows what they're trying to prevent actually? So. Now, if this group would um, already be, um, you know, needing at least some uh, 
sea change in policy, they would definitely need to have this, what we're seeing with Trump. Um, now, simultaneously, the, the, um, the managers of the power elite that have been our political leaders and the corporate leaders um, and big tech leaders, all the oligarchs, they've been um, trying to keep it together on this agenda that was more based upon the continuity of, trans of transatlanticism and, the, and globalization. So between transatlanticism and globalization, they had this, that this, these were the policies to pursue and these are the things that are gonna be the winning successes. And that has like underscored much of their thinking with what we call the globalists, but you know, globalization is their theory of the globalists. So um, transatlanticism is very strongly part of this. It's integral. You, you can't have globalism without transatlanticism. You can't have transatlanticism succeed potentially without globalism because they need to have that. Globalism includes soft power and it's just this default thinking that the West is advanced, is the West is correct, the West is the right path and all these things. Just culturally in from TV shows to pop culture to geopolitics, popular philosophy, you know, standard of living ideas, whatever, just that that's the model. So this type of Western, West centric thinking is also deeply embedded in these institutions. Um, so one could have those views, however, and not agree with those institutions. I'm just saying that typically these institutions have people that have these views as well. So um, <clears throat> where that has put us then is like, okay, um, if there was an, a different group, um, it's possible that in the West, the very, the very top owners of the major assets um, can see that Trump's direction or the team that got Trump to be viable still um, is a better solution, even for them. It's possible that they can see that Trump is a better solution, even for the very powers that be in the West. So, and like I said, these are not either or, like it could have been a long fight. It could have been an achievement that happened recently, but it could be that the, that the, even the very leaders in the West are starting to change their view about the upmost limits of resetism or the upmost limits of globalization. They need like a different perspective or a new paradigm about how to continue staying in power, like without thinking that they can rule the world, right? So in other words, like just how companies have downsizing and even that, and that downsizing, if they can show they're going to be more profitable, actually can increase the stock value. So likewise, they're like, how can we trim the empire or how can we like, you know, re- focus our messaging and kind of refocus our whole reason for existing, maybe abandon, maybe dump, dump the Middle East, okay, dump globalism, dump Europe, dump transatlanticism, right? What what are the things, how does that work in that context? So that's that's kind of like the the two different uh, possibilities with, with Trump. But either in, in either iteration, you can see that there's like, there's even Trump recently spoke about, um, you know, the the, the direction that sanctions against Russia and Iran have gone. That, that doesn't really solve the problem. That actually is like uh, not the solution at all. So he talked about getting out of sanctions uh, with those countries, I believe. So um, this is all, of course, uh, something that would allow the um, United States to have uh, some type of a, another angle to integrate into BRICS. Potentially, with the United States, like this idea. See, one of the things that's very, and I'm glad you this question, just because just broadly, this idea that it's good that the dollar is going to be like down and out. That's not what countries that countries that are pursuing, uh, you know, uh, mixed currency baskets, countries that are that are um, that have dumped the dollar somewhat only to only to diversify their portfolio like they still don't want to see the dollars that they hold like lose value and like other things in their portfolio are also quasi dependent on the dollar and what the dollar how people think of the dollar so these no one really wants to see the dollar like take a nosedive and i think so i think now that that now that it's been made clear that there is the possibility to tank the dollar it will get the people whose job it is to value the dollar, 
by how much of the dollar exists or how many dollars there are to start thinking more soberly about how they value that dollar or how many they have in circulation or available hypothetically in a you know binary digital sense. And um, so though that's a type of leverage that BRICS and developing world has now on the IMF. So you can think of the IMF as being one of the main institutions that's propped up the dollar as, as a developmental scheme um, for decades among those many, many other, the, the treasury bond systems, treasury bond sales. But um, yeah, it's, but no, the thing, the, the thing we're just saying is like, no one wants to see the dollar destroyed. Yeah, that would be very bad for everybody. But it would make sense if the dollar had a, had a value that was closer to its real value. Uh, we got a few more questions. We got Jerry, CJ, uh, Monty, Rick. So Jerry, you're up. Oh, thanks, Matt. And uh, thanks, Joaquin, for this wonderful opportunity to pick your brain. I wanted to ask you a question about Germany and the recent elections they had there. I know there was uh, two of the states had state elections. And it seemed it was a big upset, and it was big gains for the uh, alternative, the AFD, and um, I forget her name, Sarah. I can't remember her last name. BSW. Yeah, Wegenek, the left party. Yeah, Sarah yes. Wegenek, the left party. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So here in Canada, you know, our major media, on the one, you read an article that says, oh, Germany's going to the far right, and they're trying to scare us. And then the next article, they try to scare us and say Germany's going to the far left. So they they either can't figure out what's going on or they do know what's going on and they just want to keep us confused. So I thought you actually being in Europe would probably have a good view of how people see the results of that election and if it's really going to be a, a big change over there. Thanks. Yeah, no, it's a very good question. Um, I remember that um, that the uh, when the AFD and the Austrian Freedom Party both were still in their infancies, two of their um, earlier, you could say, political organizers, excited ideologists, so to speak, uh, met with uh, Manuel Opsenreiter and myself in Belgrade. And uh, we spent an evening uh, just talking about the the la larger long term strategy of what the the Freedom Party and and what the uh, uh, Alternative for Deutschland uh, would be doing. Um, and so this was all oh, this goes back to 2014 or, or 15 or thereabouts. So about 10 years ago, I guess now. Anyhow, uh, the effect of that meeting, uh, what the takeaway was, was that. They were going to be, uh, they had projected anyway, independent of the uh, unknowing that Germany would become further entangled in the Donbass war, what, you, what at the time would have just been known as the Donbass war or the Donbass conflict 10 years ago. Um, it was already known that uh, Germany had a number of disastrous policies uh, ranging from energy to migration and uh, that these were at odds with um, how the German public had even been um, allowed to express difference within a narrower confines that have been, that are somewhat a part of the German political culture of in, in let's say respectable culture um, is well, let's say that in political conversations, people are called upon less to speculate or to or to or to give some sort of strong uh, conclusion or opinion about which way things should go based upon that. So it, uh, the culture had been sort of um, in a direction where expressing opinions beyond what was sort of detected to be the some more narrow meeting of acceptable opinion was like harder to to navigate so they had to um, reach a, a younger generation a different and a different type of German so 
what the AFD's main strategy was, was to get people voting who were not people that had voted in a long time, people that had not been voting for a while, because there was really no one that represented them. And um, and they had to normalize the what they were doing um, by showing how ludicrous it was these attempts to silence them and the, the attempts at censorship. It had been going on for a long time. Now, um, the uh, where the AFD this last the last election one of the states uh, well the last election in Germany um, is a is um, one that I think probably highlights the how what you are seeing being termed right wing populist is just a, a way to get people not to look at the populist or what the populist platform actually is. And um, and by using words like extremist, by using words like hate or something like this, they want to make you think that it's something else. What I think that they've had as a messaging success is they have not successfully had the tag neo-Nazi stick to them. So that's a very, this is not like the National Democratic Party or something like this. And this is, they're not anything like this. This is a different generation. It's, it's the people involved, you know, early on just don't have the connection to historical Nazism or to neo-Nazism in Germany. Um, yet the media wants to call it far right. So the thing that's actually uh, at issue is that the things that were the in the history of, of Germany and, and in the history of Western Europe, a lot of these things that were the the rhetorical points at the very least of the left-wing parties, the historical socialist and communist parties in Western Europe, um, these are the these are no longer positions that they can take on a lot of range of questions, social questions, because the the communist parties had before the rise of the new left been based mostly in um, in not in conservative culture, but in traditional culture. So there's a difference between conservative and traditional. But it, it, I mean, it's more likely that you find aspects of conservative in tradition, but there's also traditions that are not conservative. So um, there, the, the traditional, um, the, the, the way that, um, that cultural freezing operated in the Eastern, in East Germany during the period of when it was, when East Germany was part of the Warsaw Pact. Um, this is the same area that you're seeing. These are the same among the same areas that you're seeing the AFD be strong generally. And in one of the one of the regions, at least, that they performed well in the last in Thuringia, Thuringia, in the last election. So um, what we're saying here is that a lot of the things that the AFD is saying are very similar to what would have been a normal uh, communist party position in the 40s or 50s. It's um, it's just what uh, the way that the left in Western Europe has changed in in decades, um, with the introduction of, of uh, you know the kind of the post-structuralist and um, critical uh, critical school critical theory and post-structuralism, have had a very strong influence on the Western left on Western Marxism, and um, the focus on gender, on Freud, and gender and intersectionality. Um, and, and there's a lot more subjectivity um, to their understanding of exploitation, um, whereas, you know, in the in the old model, the old left, um, which are areas that the AFD um, was is able to pick up from um, people that simultaneously um, are looking for an anti looking for a populist politic one that reflects uh, a, a general rejection of the status quo, you know, including the, you know, whether it's the communists or the, the Western German bureaucrats and corporatists, this is a different generation altogether. So, but where you've had this, um, where you had so much of the um, industrial parts of Germany and the parts that were actually, that made Germany uh, post unification so so wealthy were the parts of the of the industrialized parts in the east 
And um, whereas in Western Germany, you have more of a, you know, it's, this is, we're generalizing, of course, but it's stark, more financial services. And anyway, it's a, and the, and the, and the service economy. So Eastern, the Eastern parts of Germany that were part of the Eastern Germany, when it was East Germany, um, people have seen the market decline of since, uh, you know, for decades with the way that the, those industries were sold off or shut down. Um, the ones that stayed open until recently, now those are in jeopardy or have shut down because Germany is paying uh, 1.65 or 1.75 times the median price of energy of G7 countries or G6 countries. Why should Germany be paying almost double for energy? Well, they're supposed to be, besides the United States, like the productive juggernaut of Europe. So, you know, one of the debates that's emerged in this sort of transatlantic panic has been, where did we actually see Germany in all of this? Because on the one hand, if you're really going to actually defeat uh, Russia militarily, even in a conventional way, that would follow the plan they were talking about. Like it would be something that just hurt their economy and cause people to be mad at Putin and vote him out or something. So even for that to work, you need a powerful Germany. But all of these policies and plans we see are weakening Germany. So it's kind of it's it seems that they're very concerned that if Germany had more had had more access to affordable energy, or if Germany was actually that they would actually on their own volition be closer to Moscow geopolitically. But that just speaks to a different logic. And so then it's like, well, why not allow them to do that? Right. I mean, if that's what they think is better for them. And so then what are we imposing on Germany? Anyway, but yeah, that that's these are all like the themes in the background of this of, of this election. CJ, I don't know if you're asking the question for on, for yourself yeah. or from one of the listeners on Rogue News, but go for it. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, Walking, thank you for a great uh, conversation. Am I coming across okay? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, great. Great. You're wonderful. Yeah. So in regards to the uh, European Union, the Eurozone, uh, you know, we're seeing a little bit of a contraction in the economy, understanding that energy prices and so forth. Would that be potentially one of the, the key indicators that potentially would lead them uh, to pivot away from the Western hegemony, uh, the BRICS that continue to expand. I think Turkey just announced that uh, they're willing to join, which basically would remove them from NATO. So the the G7 or the Insolvent 7, whatever you want to call them, is that potentially a key to them pivoting away from Western hegemony and in particular with the, the policies in Ukraine? Yes, I, um, I think that at the for is a very good question. Thank you for it. Yeah, I think you're spot on. Not only is it something on the horizon from the very beginning of the conflict, key policy analysts as well as um, people who are forecasters in the private market area have all been saying the same thing: that what whatever they think they're doing in Ukraine as a war with Russia, the, the biggest loser besides Ukraine is Germany. And so, why is Germany? Why is the euro? getting hit so hard, right? And of course, as you said, this relates to their sanctions on Russia, which is on the energy sector, which gives them very expensive energy. So then how does that work? How they can, how can they be, how can they remain competitive? Well, they can't. So obviously the market, their market has contracted. Interestingly, the interesting thing is that the dollar, that the US has been able to play a game. And even though it has its own process going on, They've been keeping themselves relatively tied to the, the, they've been keeping their own price close to the historic difference in price between the euro and the dollar. So if you look at over the course of, say, like a five year, one year or six year, you're going to see that same basic trend that spread between about, let's say, uh, one dollar uh, uh, to a euro. You would have, uh, let's say, about a dollar ten to a dollar twenty buying a euro. And that's been that's been there's been times it's gone over and above that. You look at the last five, 10 years, that's pretty much how they keep it. So what does that mean about what the dollar is doing relative to the actual contraction of the of the European economy? Is the dollar are we hiding our own contraction by people who just kind of uh, look at the dollars as a as a, in terms of a floating currency in the basket of currencies? Well, if we normally people, you know, are, are looking at the dollar relative to the euro. But if both of these are going down, 
people are going to be seeing that same relative uh, distance between the two, same relative value, and they're not going to think that the dollar is in as bad a shape as it is. So if you want to actually see where we where we don't want the dollar to go, keep keeping it in that same range. I mean, it, it, at this point in time, you know, a, a dollar should buy, um, you know, a dollar should buy a euro 20, a dollar, a euro 30. It shouldn't be anywhere close to the other way around. So um, it, it's that's what's incoherent because the U.S. doesn't have these energy costs. Right. So that just means that in the U.S. they're just doing what upward redistributing the wealth. So they're fleecing, they're fleecing and they're hiding that behind this kind of currency value. People are just tracking the, the, the euro and going, OK, and that's looks like because people just talk about when you talk about inflation, people watch MSNBC or CNN, uh, maybe even like Bloomberg and Forbes and stuff like that. People are always looking at the euro and they, they do they do talk about the Nikkei index. They do get into yen. They do get into um, the they do get into the renminbi, the yuan. But um, in terms of how the, the cultural aspect and how viewers are typically following the Western economy as being the center of the economy. So um, a lot of that peripheral stuff is not noise. The people who are actually looking at changes between the yuan or renminbi and the U.S. dollar are the ones that have seen like the, the biggest changes in the past five years. If you go like five year, one year, six month and you look at you try to take the micro trends and you're trying to look you're trying to extrapolate uh, shorter periods and you want to compare those to the, the, the patterns that you see over longer periods. So I think um, <clears throat> I think that if uh, since these policy analysts and government insiders in Germany and France, et cetera, have known that this will happen, they're complicit. So for them, I mean, they've known and they've informed the government, so the governments are complicit. I'm not saying that the analysts are complicit. Strike that. Uh, the analysts have informed, the governments and policymakers in Europe are aware of what you're aware of and what I'm aware of. And they've been seeing it since day one. And it's, and there's been, Evidence of it is even in their own regular papers like Politico, which is a German paper that speaks like U.S. woke or U.S. transatlanticist geopolitics. But it's a German paper and um, they've gotten it out there like they, they do have ways of communicating that they know that it's damaging their economy. So now when you see Bloomberg or uh, Wall Street Journal, they don't even hide it anymore that the European economy is, is, is suffering. Um, so now the point is that the question that you're really actually asking, then this is why it's so good. This is a question about agency and sovereignty. Like do the leaders of these Western European states actually have the sovereignty to change the direction or are they so much puppets of simply the Washington consensus that they're gonna drive their own people, their own countries into the ground? And that to me, that's just crazy because that opens up like a broader question of like, what if they ruin those economies and drive them to war? Like, because that would be the double whammy. Well, you know, a lot of people have been warning about this for a long time. I mean, I remember see, seeing people like Gerald Salenti like 20 years ago saying that when the elites can't think of the next way to make a buck, they start a war. So I'm, that's where I'm thinking. Thank you. All right, I think I know you have to get back to the family, Joaquin. So I know we're running slowly out of time here. Um, do you have time for one more question? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, Monty, it's all yours. Okay, thank you, Joaquin. Take my question. I appreciate hey, it most. Uh, good to see you again, Monty. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look at Joaquin. Uh, you, you may, there's a, a big thing going on about the threat of nuclear war, right? And in one sense, I think it could be a, a red herring. To, I mean, not that there's not a threat of nuclear war, but I think it can be somewhat of a red herring or a limited hangout to distract from what I think it is, I think, is pretty well self-evident now. The powers that be, and in my mind, it is through the city of London and these occult kind of networks, Operation Gladio and so forth, I think we've seen that they were willing to sacrifice Ukraine for their ends. And then it became, I think, it's apparent they're willing to sacrifice Europe for their ends. 
And I might agree with you that uh, nobody wants to see the dollar collapse, at least within these power structures. But I think, uh, like Lyndon LaRue said, it's inevitable and it's imminent that it will collapse. I mean, we're looking at four quadrillion in outstanding derivatives, $36 trillion in debt. <clears throat> and I think these wars that we're in are hastening, hastening that. And uh, as LaRouche also commented, at the time of this collapse, we can either save the paper or save the people. And I think the next game plan is, uh, given the way things are going against, you know, they're not winning in Ukraine. I mean, th things are looking bad from them on all fronts. I think it's come a point where perhaps they're willing to sacrifice the United States now. And what I mean by that, the, uh, the failure of the dollar system is inevitable. But what would make it sink at home as being fatal is the inability for supply chain logistics through China in particular to be act as a means of recovery. Uh, because the United States doesn't have that capacity by itself. With, so with the forwarding of NATO and everything in China, I think that might be their next move. Uh, and I'm hearing that from various sectors at this point. Could you comment on that, please? Hmm. So just to clarify, um, on the on the on the contingency of the United States being the sacrifice. I think that's what they're looking at right now. In other words, uh, initially, I think they were willing to sacrifice Europe and maybe the center of power in the United States, which they can still control. But the United States is more and more coming out of their control now as people are awakening to what uh, what is happening on the world stage. Uh, so I think the willingness now is to sacrifice the people. In other words, eliminate any potential through forward basing of NATO to shut down the supply chains out of China, which we are and the world is utterly dependent upon. Uh, I know it sounds crazy. It's something like a, Sam a Samson option in one sense, but uh, I don't think who's calling the shots is necessarily within the United States. I think there's a higher role of players where they're, they're, they're on the way out the door. They recognize they're failing. They recognize it's the end game. They recognize it's an existential crisis. So I think their last hope is to cause chaos within the U.S. And that could certainly, I mean, this collapse is inevitable and our only hope out of this financial collapse is a restructuring of manufacturing, of trade, of development. Uh, so the oligarchy basically wants to eliminate the potential of that happening. That's my view. Okay. okay. Um, so when I when when you're saying this, I'm I'm thinking of all these different uh, pieces of evidence that would that would lead to confirming that opinion. Like I'm. I'm and they're, they're coming up. I'm thinking, I'm like, yeah, that checks, that checks. So in my opinion, there's a lot of corroborating evidence uh, behind the idea that they could be trying to destroy in some way the U.S., to destroy the U.S. So um, in one in one scenario, you were saying that it looked like they could maybe destroying Europe was the thing. Um, now. Another, they could destroy the United States. Um, I think that wherever that they, wh whenever there's a country that they're going to be tearing down and deconstructing and kind of making all that money off of the chaos and vampiristic stuff on the way out, kind of, you know, to shake all the bananas uh, off the tree while the tree is going down, right? So while they're doing that and there's probably um, a widespread belief that the majority of the population are useless eaters, in the words of Kissinger. So it would make sense that there would be some type of Malthusian agenda in some way oriented at population reduction rapidly. There's many things that are possible in their plans with regard to this. Um, it would seem to me that the necessity of being in possession of, of a quality 
which gives you access to massive military as, uh, uh, assets, that gives you access to massive military assets is still a, a primary target or primary um, thing to achieve or to hold on to. So if they, if they were not gonna be based in the United States, there would have to be some other region that they would want to be going to. Now, <clears throat> another very pertinent point that you made is you're separating the, these people who can, who can you know, leave the United States and rule from somewhere else, right? I mean, they might have been born in the United States. A lot of them have U.S. passports. A lot of them are American citizens, and they might even some in some way feel American. But we know, I mean, just look at the real history of the world. Like, look at the Armenian diaspora. Yeah. Look at how they betrayed, you know, Armenia so much. Look at the, pol at the politics of just when there's mass populations of diaspora, you can see that people can simultaneously feel that there's something and have some sentiment or some part of their culture shaped by that. And on the other hand, it, out of personal interest or some vision that they're just going to be building somewhere else now and then just right leave the country behind. So the very top elite are even less nationally sentiment because they've, they've always grown up in more global, you know, they grew up, uh, they lived, oh, they grew up actually in Paris and they had an au pair and, the, you know, their family was uh, just like Anthony Blinken's family, right? Like he went to, he went to school in, in France, right? Like these people live in different places. They like, they don't really, they have different passports and those passports are more like various legal or tax uh, games that which one helps. Well, if you get charged with a crime, better to be an American, but you know, when it's time to put your money in a bank, better to be Swiss or better to be Cypriot or whatever, right? So they, for them, the country doesn't mean the thing that it means to people that have this attachment to the history and the land and the culture. So in that sense, they're globalists, you know, they're, they're, they're globetrotters, they're internationalists, in the, but of the elite type in this kind of, you know, global bourgeois sense of the word. Um, now, I would think that they would have I, so I do see a lot of the trends and many of the policies and plans that still ongoing, but were definitely kicked into high gear in the U.S. Definitely seemed like it was based on policing. It seemed like one big hedge against the outcome of the U.S. Now, but to me, that means that they would have. I think that they had intended um, to fully take over Russia. I think they I think that they could have become Russian citizens. You know, I think that they could have taken over Russia, and then from having taken over Russia, then they could be the ones to implement the policy of connecting Europe to Russia. So then they would be the ones that control the mega complex. And the U.S., yeah, they, they would have left behind. So, um, you know, because they're, they're failing in this destruction of Russia thing, you know, they might have decided just to stay, you know, with the U.S. model. And then, so one way would be to not destroy the U.S. They still have some downsizing to do. They still have some people to fleece. But if they can avoid being removed from power, at least give back enough to stay in power, they'd be wisest to try to consolidate things in an area that are within the, in this, uh, you know, get away from the idea of, let's say the U.S. as world police or global enforcer and sort of reassert like a Monroe Doctrine, like a Monroe Doctrine 2.0 and really focus on Latin America. And then, so think of all those resources and assets they can pull out of the Middle East. Think of all those assets and resources they can pull out of Ukraine, out of Israel, uh, out of Indochina or the Pacific. And imagine if all of that know-how, energy, bureaucracy, military, investment, if all that was focused on Latin America. See, that's something, they have multiple ways to get there. They can travel by sea, but on coastal routes, it's not like trans-oceanic travel. They can travel by land. They could build a railroad system that connects the U.S. all the way to the southern tip, Chile. They can go from Alaska to Chile, right? There's all types of rail projects that can be done. So, I mean, the thing is that it's 
there are questions, there are broader questions though that I don't have answers to, but obviously, but I think what well, I like the way that, that what you put out there, because it's a very real possible, they've definitely considered it if they're not doing it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I'm reminded of the Knights of the Golden Circle. They had a, a plan at one point to basically install a confederacy around Cuba to control all of, and and that might be their intention. And when I, I talk about destroying the United States, I'm talking about destroying the idea of it. In other words, a traditional American system of political economy. That's not to say that they can't oh, I maintain. Yeah, yeah. They, I mean, they, they can't. Could, they they can't maintain. Do thing. Like they could stay maintain the territorial controllers of the of the industry and the and the human capital, but without the constitution. Yeah, without, and without the potential for recovery, it's manufacturing, industrial base, and cooperation, a harmony of interest amongst other countries. In other words, just complete chaos. Just complete right. chaos. Yeah, no, there's, yeah. there's a lot of way for individuals to make money that way. Uh, they, yeah. I think they would just need a more stable, predictable place in the world to invest in. And I think that if you go into the 80s, go back to the 1980s, they were expecting that they could, you know, do that in China. But, you know, if you consider like, let's say, Tiananmen to be a showdown of some kind in the post Tiananmen, uh, they didn't get their way. They didn't get their way. So it's, um, you know, it's like they are, they have been looking like, oh, can we get in? Can we get into China? You know, can we get into Moscow? And it was like, oh, these doors get slammed, even though it looks like they make these big headway and they get their, their hands in there. And then, you know, they but they don't they don't take over. So. Yeah, thank you, Joaquin. I look forward to seeing you back on Telegram. All right. You got it. Yeah, I know we got to round out. I, I know for myself, I, I do think about this a lot and, and I I share your concerns, Monty. And, you know, I, based on what you just went through, Joaquin, in regards to that, like the way I sort of see it is that there's two sort of possible currents or not possible, but truly active currents within the 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 republican sort of maga groups that would be inclined to vector around uh, the figure of trump and on the one hand you have this positive mckinley lincoln sort of tradition which is being revived and i think that that does speak to the majority of the people who resonate with this hope to to reject the globalist transhumanist thing and restore some real sense of of national sovereign behavior with a healthy mckinley uh a healthy monroe doctrine for Latin America, you know, to work in harmony with other nations of of Central and South America and Mexico for development. And then you got this other thing that, Monty, you just spoke to, which for me, I I, I shudder at that aspect of it that represents that Knights of the Golden Circle, KKK, revival orientation of a libertarian empire managed by a new transhumanist elite, but with a different, you know, more palantir Elon Musk type of, uh, you know, one stop shop, uh, new currency that's tied to your behavior. That's not that different philosophically from their liberal counterparts from, represented by Harari and other things. Totally, totally share that that deep, deep trepidation that you you've just expressed. Um, but we'll see. I mean, the fight is on. It's clearly the, it's clear that you could define these different opposing paradigms that are that are clashing and vying for influence in the new system that will be brought online and which one that's going to look like is is underdefined so hopefully we can do our part to make sure that the uh, the one that's actually in tune with natural law uh takes the edge so with that Joaquin, i don't know if you have any final remarks before we uh, we round it out you know, i just wanted to thank you for uh, allowing me to talk to your great people and uh run through what we think about the situation in the world right now, as you said, so many things you know, bubbling over, so many things on fire. Um, the thing that really jumped out again, I'm going to say it again, and it, I think people need to actually meditate on this, um, what you said, how close we are to the type of nuclear showdown. Just the the sort of, uh, you know, like that clock that the, to, to midnight of the nuclear holocaust, um, you know, those people, they're their own project, right? That's not reliable. But even they've, if you look at the clock, they're like, Ch -ch -ch -ch. so it's, um, the warnings have been made from the Russian side. They clearly make their warnings to clarify their position 
it doesn't mean that the next thing that they do is going to be to attack a NATO country. But I would say, just to finish off our earlier conversation, I promise that there are more um, that there are more mercenary and foreign soldier bases and accumulation centers in Ukraine that the Russians could hit any time and, uh, and decide to hit them uh, in response to these types of things. Uh, there, that just shows how much management they have over the flow, the ebb and flow of the conflict and what they seem to be doing and the time that they seem to want to do it in. And uh, the attack on the uh, mercenary center, I think, um, was they had actually hit a, a earlier in the year several large French installations on the territory of Ukraine as well. That kind of raises questions about the Pavel Durov detention and what you know some of that stuff is about with uh, with him being arrested in France. But um, you know these uh, these NATO countries have not pulled the brakes on getting the mercenaries in there. And we're only one or two provocations away from a chain of escalated acute responses that could, you know, go into a nuclear direction, you know, within weeks or less. So it's important that people remain vigilant, but aware, circulate information so that people know, you know, and this, this is something I can't advise people which way, but you look at the candidates and you look at, you know, and if the one thing that people do is, uh, is communicate to others what they see is happening in the world. And that, that has to be, that's gotta be more important than voting. Um, voting is one part of something that people do. Some people where they live, there's no, there's no real difference about what happens when you vote, right? And uh, but more and more, there are political processes that are following the logic of the path of least resistance in terms of how processes have, of change happen. It's not unusual for some part of the powers that be to compromise and retreat and allow a vector within the public sphere to emerge within the polity, within the plurality, within the pluralist system. Um, for there to be genuine political voice, you know, that it, that and, you know, but it, it, there are so, there is so much more besides voting is what I'm saying. But in the United States, definitely this presidential outcome, just in light of the assassination attempt, the people behind that attempt could not be the good guys. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I can't say, you know, who to vote for, but I think anyone looking at how the party of war has lined up and who they've tried to kill. Um, I would just also suggest, though, that voting in elections is not the place to put your your eggs all in that basket. And it's like that's voting is more like the temperature test at the end of a lot of other political work, but getting out there, interacting with people, sharing ideas, learning when, in the times that there's time to learn, political philosophy in the background of those ideas, all of that is so fundamental. So here we are now and uh, yeah. Amen, those are, those are very wise words. So let's, Chew on that for the the next several days. Try to internalize some of these insights and uh, and yeah, thank you so much, Joaquin, for for sharing and for participating in this this very important discussion. Uh, next week we're going to have something from Gordon McCormick, my co-host at uh, Breaking History, who's going to go through some deep history and tie that to the the future. Um, don't even know what the top the topic's going to be, but knowing Gordon, it'll it'll be cool. So with that, Joaquin, thank you so much, man. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.